Texas Lutheran University. Welcome everyone to the uh, next in our biology seminar series. Uh, we will have next week. Yes, we have another talk next week. Uh, next week we'll have someone from the Health Science Center at San Antonio come in talking about their immunology and microbiology program there. They have a master's degree program for those of you interested in maybe a shorter two-year uh, degree program. But today we have a special uh, seminar because uh, our speaker has been invited by one of our students. So this is very good for us so when we have a student who's interested in bringing in a speaker. So I'll let Evan Basha introduce uh, Dr. Steele. So my name is Evan Bosch, I'm the president of the Free Health Professions Club here at TOU. Uh, in case you didn't notice on the signs that were put up around the science buildings, this talk is actually being sponsored by the Free Health Professions Club. So our, our uh, guest speaker today is Dr. Kevin Steele. Dr. Steele is a Air Force cardiologist over at the San Antonio Military Medical Center in SAMC. I had a, a fantastic opportunity to shadow Dr. Steele for about two weeks before school had started. Um, so he's going to give us some talks today about his undergraduate experiences all the way up to being a cardiologist here at San Antonio. So please, walk, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Steele. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm um, just going to talk about my, the steps that I took to get to where I am uh, today. And, and uh, I, think, I think I did a pretty decent job of getting there although I kind of bumbled along along the way. And, and, uh, and I'll kind of point some of those, issues, those areas out where um, I probably could have done things better uh, for that. So I think that uh, not, this doesn't just apply for people that are interested in uh, medicine or going into medical school or health professions. I think that, that some of the things that I'll bring up today can apply to anybody who's interested in getting a job after you, after you get out of here. And so hopefully that's most of you uh, are interested in getting a job. So, so I've got to pay attention for some of this. Some of it, this is just my own personal history. So I don't have too much military stuff in here, but uh, inevit inevitably I have to talk a little bit about my military experience since I've been in the Air Force for 17 years. So some of that will be in there. So, okay, so everything, uh, oh, there we go. That's my first time using Prezi too, so. I'm, ex I'm excited. I'm excited about this new format. Uh, so this is where I'm from, Tacoma, Washington. I'm not from Texas, or as you'll see, I've moved around a lot since uh, being here. And this is where I went uh, uh, to high school and where, where I grew up. And, and uh, I bring this up just to say that, that uh, as a student, I was interested in science. Um, I was interested in, I did pretty well in math, so I kind of gravitated toward those sort of things when I was in high school. Um, but I didn't really think that I wanted to do medicine right off the bat. I actually wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to be an airline pilot. Uh, and I thought that was, that was a pretty cool job to have. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's kind of where, where I came from. And so when I was selecting out schools to go to uh, or, or colleges, I, I thought, well, I want to go to somewhere that's going to make me a good pilot. And so there are, there are schools out there that, that can do that, that kind of select those people out and uh, train people to be pilots and oh by the way you get the little bachelors on the side. So that, that was my thought but, uh, um, but then things kind of changed because, because of my interest in science uh, and, uh, and as I thought more about what it's like to actually be a pilot I, I thought well that's not a very cool job actually so <laughs> no offense to anybody whose parents are pilots but uh, um. anyway so uh, moving on, on from there uh, then I went to Central Washington University. So Central Washington University is in the middle of Washington State, um, and the climate is more like it is around here. It's a small, small university, uh, just like this. Maybe not quite as small as this, but pretty small like this. And so that was a great experience to, to be with a small class size and such. And, and at Central is where I, I kind of changed from one to become a pilot to to getting more into medicine. And so what drove me, what, what caused me to change that way, one, like I said, is when you kind of think about what pilots do, 
You know, they're like bus drivers except up in the air. And they're, they're doing the same thing over and over again. And so it may sound cool when you're at parties to say, yeah, I'm a commercial pilot and I just flew to Germany and back, but, but it's kind of a boring job. So uh, I wanted to do something that was more interesting, but also from my experience uh, through in high school and in college when I was in, in the summer having jobs uh, to pay for college, um, I realized that I wanted to be my own boss and I wanted to be in control of my future and I didn't want to have someone dictating that. And so what's a job that can pay pretty well, that, that's, prestige, that's kind of prestigious because I wanted to feed my ego and also uh, I could be my own boss, you know, and so, and, and because I like the sciences, so that's kind of why I gravitated towards, uh, towards medicine from that standpoint. And so usually, I think it was in my sophomore year, I started to think about, well, I think I'm gonna to start to do pre-med. And so how do you, so what's the first step is you gotta find some advisor somewhere, right, for that. Well, this Central Washington University is known for making pilots. It's one thing that it does, and they also are big with education. They also have a big chimp lab for the, if there's people that are doing the psychology or psychiatry in here. They're the ones that do the, the chimps that do the sign language. That's kind of their claim to fame with that, with Central. And so none of that has to do with medicine. Uh, so so uh, first I had to find the pre-med advisor. And that's, that was my first problem, which actually wasn't my problem, was the school had a, the, our pre-med advisor was just horrible and, and didn't really advise. So that's kind of you know part of the title is you got to advise if you're going to be the pre-med advisor. <laughs> but he didn't really advise uh, uh, very well. So I showed up and said, hey, I'm interested in medicine. What do I need to do? And he said, okay, take these classes, study the MCAT, and there you go. And that, that was the advice <laughs> for that. And, and that was it. So I can tell already you guys have a much more robust program when it comes to pre-medical and, and health professions than, than Central had at the time. So, um, so that's the first part is, is get, get with the pre-med advisor. And then, um, yeah, and then he said take the MCATs. And so when I took the MCATs, I actually hadn't taken biochemistry yet. So that was another bad piece of advice is <laughs> no biochemistry before you take the MCAT um, because the Krebs cycle was very foreign to me and there was a lot of questions <laughs> about the Krebs on there. I don't use any of that now, but it's okay. Uh, but, uh, um, but the, the MCATs are, uh, were important, uh, and so uh, we gotta make sure that you study for that or whatever the admissions test is for that, that college. You gotta study for that and make sure you know what skills you need to have to actually do pretty decent on that test. Those MCAT scores haunt you also when you apply for residency, when you apply for a fellowship, those are still looked at all the way back, which I don't think is very fair, but. I'm a fellowship director now, and, and I look at them for my cardiology fellows, and I'm like, well, you didn't do so well on the verbal, and you know, when you graduated from college, and it's like, well, that, you know, that's eight years ago, so <laughs> doesn't for me, it doesn't really have that much of an impact, but it is still looked at uh, somewhat. And so if you have um, if you have really good scores, it's nice. Sometimes that can carry you through. Uh, so uh, then you had to apply for, you know, have to apply for medical school. So like I said, having good MCAT scores is, it's nice to have because that can help carry you part of the way, at least get you in the door. Uh, you know, some schools have cutoffs, minimal cutoffs, and so that's what I said, to get into the door, you may need to have a, I don't know what the score is now, but it might be a 30 MCAT. For the military, there's a minimum, uh, which is about 24. If you get above, I think it's a 28, you can be automatically accepted in and to uh, get a military scholarship. But, uh, but, but 30 is a really kind of a nice number to have, which I didn't have actually. I think I had a 27 or 28, something like that. So, um, so that's part of it is the MCAT scores, but also to have a great application is you have to have done something that sets you apart from everybody else. You know? So when you're in, in that interview, and we'll talk about the interview in a second, is what makes you different? What makes each of you different from each other when you're all competing for the same spot? And, and why would I pick one person over another? And so that just, you just have to look at, look at yourself and, and what, what are those things? Because good grades is, is part of that. Good MCATs is part of that. But, but everybody that's applying to medical school has good grades and good MCATs, right? So that's not gonna set you apart. So it has to be something, something else needs to do that. And so uh, there's medical, there's some extracurricular opportunities like Evan, rotated, uh, spent some time with me. So that's part of that is, 
is uh, spending some time in the medical community so you actually know what you're getting into. What does a cardiologist do? What does a surgeon really do? You know, what is the emergency room? What's it really like in there? Is it like it is on TV, which it isn't? <laughs> or, or is it more like a lot of drug seekers and things like that um, and in chronic pain? Uh, so that's part of that is the medical part because that's what they're gonna wanna know is do you know what you're getting yourself into? But also some non-medical extracurricular things uh, that just kind of can set you apart. So that's like a volunteering. Uh, it could be uh, research that you do. Uh, maybe there's something you had published, you know, maybe it's music you recorded or some art or something, something that just kind of says, okay, I remember this person because they did, they did whatever, they did this thing. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have that either. <laughs> I had the medical part, I didn't have the non-medical part. I, I just kind of, you know, got to get my bachelor's and then I, the logical step is the next med school and that, that didn't work out too well for me. So um, leadership roles is a nice thing because as, as, at least as a physician, you're gonna be a leader whether you want to be or not. People are going to look up to you. You're gonna, you're gonna have a staff of people. Uh, doesn't matter what specialty you're in, that you're gonna be running an operating room. You're gonna be in charge, the one in charge there, or you're gonna be the one in charge in the ER or the one in the clinic. Uh, you could have a large staff under you. I've worked with a cardiologist who has 45 people in his clinic that help support him. So he's in charge of all those people. So, so you have to have some sort of leadership skills and that's where the medical schools are looking to say, well, do you have any of those skills? Have you proven that? You know, are you president of some club? Or are, are you uh, doing Sunday school at church? You know, those sort of things that says that, that you're, you're kind of stepping out and trying to, trying to show that you actually can manage a handful of people. Now, the last part about the, the medical school application, it's a school selection. So it costs money to apply to medical school for each application you put in. So if you have a lot of money, you can just apply to all of them and shotgun it and hope you get something. You know, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. And so I had to be very selective. And that makes a difference also. So, so when you're looking at medical schools or you're looking at a school to go to PA school or nursing school or graduate school, it's, it, you have to look at what they can offer you and what can you get out of it. Do you want, to, do you want a more community-based program where you're gonna, it's gonna produce, the medical school wants to produce uh, family practice doctors, you know, that are gonna go out in the community and gonna, gonna serve the underserved areas or do you want to go to a school that is an academic school where you're going to come out and be a researcher and be a leader in medicine and more on the political side and i've had the opportunity to, to experience both of those i'll talk about those a little bit later but that's that's important you just don't want to well i'm just going to pick the school that's just down the road because my parents live in houston you know that's that's probably not a good enough reason because that school may not be what you want what do you want to get out of it and that'll come out in the interview when they ask you, why do you want to apply? And you're like, well, my parents live down the road. <laughs> you know, that, that's not a good answer at an interview. So they'll, they'll tease that out if you don't really want to go there. And then the interview. So got a special slide just on the interview. So for, hopefully they, you'll, get, you'll get an interview offer when you apply for medical school. So I, I applied to the University of Washington. That's a logical step when you're in Washington State. You applied, you applied to that big university. Uh, so, and then I was lucky enough to get an interview. And um, so these are other things I think that is the role of the advisor. The pre-med advisor should work with you on interview skills. And this is important for any job that you're gonna go to that you really wanna, if you really actually want the job. Uh, um, these are some of those things I think that uh, you need to work on and prepare for, uh, for the interview. Uh, so, I'll give you, I'll tell you about my interview experience with the University of Washington was uh, what the interview was a small group kind of like this, uh, you know, this group, like this group of doctors here was myself and then there was a panel of I think three or four people. Um, and uh, um, when I was waiting to go into the interview, I just sat in a room with all the other people that were interviewing. So there was about five other people. And so while you're sitting around waiting, we're kind of having a conversation as to, well, what do you do? Because we're trying to get a feel, try to get a feel for the competition, right? 
So you try to, in a, in a, yeah, in a nice way, try to say, am I better than you or not? <laughs> and try to, try to stratify. So like I said, I didn't really have anything I brought to the table, except I had kind of decent MCAT scores, decent GPA. That's about, that's about all that I had. <laughs> so there was one guy there that uh, uh, was a, like a silver medalist in the Olympics. He was a swimmer. Uh, there was another one that was a woman who had created the 911 system for the uh, Marshall Islands. Was a nurse, we used to be a nurse out there and, and developed their EMS system out there. Uh, and, and everybody was older than me, you know, when you graduate from, what are you, like 22, usually 22, 23 when you graduate from undergrad, uh, if you go straight through at least. Um, so everybody was older than me. So. So the, the traditional student myself was at a big disadvantage because I hadn't had any of those life experiences and I didn't do any of those experiences during undergrad, you know, so I didn't have any of that. And so then I, so that's what I was, in my mind I had when I went into the interview uh, was, man, you know, how can I compete with the Olympic medalist, <laughs> you know, and this amazing nurse that probably saved thousands of lives inadvertently. Um, with that, and so, and then, so then they then they ask you, you know, the usual interview type questions, which I kind of tried to lay out here in general. So be prepared, like I said, and, and you want to practice for your interview. It sounds kind of silly. It's kind of like uh, uh, practicing for a talk in a way if you're giving a presentation. But but I think that that helps if you if you get a bunch of your buddies together and they ask you questions, uh, so that you kind of have to think on the spot for that. Um, so you have, to, you have to sell yourself and somehow you have to work that into the conversation that, uh, um, that you, you are who they want. You know, convince them, if you're a good salesperson, you convince them that they want that product even if they don't want it. Um, <laughs> you want to look professional, so you want to dress like you're an adult. And uh, like, you, you know, and that's, they're going to look at that. That's, we do that even in the military, you know, I had someone who interviewed for a fellowship position. He had his uniform all messed up. You know, so, so if you're in the military, that's a big deal. So the same thing, you know, if you show up and, and, and you're, not, you're not dressed the part, they're going to pick up on that and it's just one reason to, to put your application aside. Um, you really want to know the school that you're interviewing at because they, they have their own egos, uh, just like myself. And so when they're sitting there, is they, they want to know that their school is the best. They want to know that their town is the best, you know, that, they, they, you know, so they, they want to know those things. And so you really have to do your research and know like, well, what, what is this school known for? You know, is this known for primary care? Is this, is this school known for its research in thrombolytics? Um, so that you can kind of bring those things up so they know that you've done your research. Uh, know that, like I said, know the town you're interviewing at. I think that you know, at some point they're going to ask, they're going to ask you, that, like, like, what do you like to do in your spare time, right? That's like the generic one that's always asked. You're like, well, you know, I, I, you'd say, well, I was out running the other day at this park, you know, or I showed up early for my interview, so I decided to go run down the river walk of San Antonio. And you're like, wow, he knows about the river walk. And, you know, so that you just kind of throw those things in there that, wow, there's something about this town that they know about. You know, I can't say like Seguin, I don't know what the, <laughs> Somehow, you know, I guess. Great yeah, there you go. There you go. There, I'm sure there's something that you can throw in there. Um, I put in there that tragedy can sell. So, um, you know, when you're writing your personal statement, you know, a lot of people uh, have something happen in their life that they convince them to do medicine or to go into the health profession. So, so that's laid out in there. And so sometimes that can be helpful. But when you're doing interviews on 300 people and you're hearing all of their tragic stories about, their brother who had cancer, their in-law who was killed in a car accident, and, and that sort of stuff, that uh, um, it starts to become noise. Unfortunately, it starts to become noise. And so you got to be a little bit careful with, uh, with, with that in the way um, uh, in, in how, how you sell that. Because not, not that's all in your personal statement, so you don't necessarily have to harp on, on that, your personal experiences. But, uh, but like I said, why are you, why are you so special? It's an important thing to, to think about. What sets you apart from others? Uh, this is important is are you an adult learner? So uh, a, a non-adult learner is somebody that goes to lectures and shows up like this and you hear someone speaking and you go home and you go play Xbox, right? And you don't do anything else. 
where a, a, uh, an adult learner is one that prepares for class by reading, which I never did that. Uh, and then afterwards, like, hey, you know, hey, that was kind of interesting. They were talking about what, what the, you know, what he was talking about. So then they go, they go home and then they, they read a little bit more on it just to, just to make, you know, just to learn a bit, a little bit more. And that's an adult learner. And that's a, an important skill that not everybody has that it kind of takes a while for that to kind of build up because we're brought up in this system where you sit in front of the lecturer and it, you know, and that's kind of how we learn throughout the, the years. And so, so that's an important skill. I think that's something to advertise that, you know, it is that you're an adult learner or that you go and read about topics that you've read some medical journals that are, you've, you've read some review articles and, and that you're actually interested in whatever the job is that you're interested in. Are you a team player? That's an important part too. Um, do you work well with others? with medicine at least and any other health professions, you're going to be working with others all the time on a team. And so that's a skill that they're going to want to see um, because that if you don't, if you're not a team player and you're not an adult learner, then you're not going to be a very good medical student. And so then you're going to be in a dean's office with bad grades, you know, or you got into a fight with somebody, you know, those sort of things can happen. <coughs> Research is, in, is a I think it's gonna, is an important part because that's one way that you can, you can set yourself apart is what is the research that you're doing, especially if you're going to an academic program. They're gonna, they're gonna expect that you have some sort of research under your belt, that you, you tagged on with, with some nice professor and you got your name on a publication somewhere. Uh, that, that carries a lot of weight because not a lot of people do that. You know? um, and so if you can have a publication uh, in anything, uh, that can carry a lot of weight. You don't have to be the primary author. You just got to say, yeah, I helped in the lab and I collected data. You know, I did research on frog urine when I was in, in uh, undergrad. And I also did uh, stuffed birds for the, uh, for the uh, science department as the dead birds would come in. Then I would stuff them and stick them in a little shelf. So a little drawer. That was my stuff I did. Um, and wh what do you think your role is in medicine? And... Uh, that, that would mean, where do you see yourself as a physician or if you're uh, going to, to be a PA? Where, where, where is your role? Where do you fall into that hierarchy? And, and what is it that, that you're trying to accomplish um, besides making money, you know? Uh, and then there, I think this is a good question is what, what will you do if you don't get accepted? So uh, besides going and being miserable for a while, but uh, what, what are you going to do? And they may ask you that. So they're, what they're looking for is, are you actually interested in becoming a doctor? Are you going to do whatever it takes to, to, be, to get into that profession? Or are you like, oh, I'm going to go do, I'm just going to go get my PhD in biology, you know, and go do research in the Canary Islands. Um, or, or are you going to say, oh, I'm going to take the MCATs again, or I'm going to, I'm going to find out why I didn't get in, I'm going to fix that, or... You know, um, so that's just something to think about when you're going in there because I ask that question about fellow applicants that are in the military when I'm doing the interviews. What if you don't get accepted? What are you gonna do? Well, some say, well, I'll just do my time and get out of the military. Well, then in my mind, I'm thinking they're not really interested in cardiology. They're just looking for another job to do. So the interview is important once you get accepted for an interview. Oop, I talked too long, that's what that means. So don't give up. So I didn't get in my first year. That's why I show this. This is actually a picture of the island of Guam. So I went to Guam where I sulked for a while in Guam. <laughs> no, my, my, uh, I follow my, um, my fiance at the time, went out there. She got, she's a, uh, got a teaching job or had an education degree at Central and she uh, wanted to go do something different. So she went to go teach on Guam. So then, then I went out there. So right away, like, ding, I, I got something that sets me apart from people. And I went to Guam when I lived there. I worked there, uh, got, a, got a job uh, in a little medical clinic out there. So, so you know, that's, you don't want to give the impression that you're going to give up. Because if you are going to give up and you say, well, I didn't get in, so then you probably don't want to do the job because it's going to get a lot harder for you mentally and emotionally. So, uh, you know, if you're not willing to take the step to get into medical school when you're up for, you know, 24 hours or 36 hours and someone's yelling at you, how are you gonna react to that if you don't really want the job, you don't really wanna do that? 
So it's a, it is a way to weed people out that way. So I ended up going back to Central, or going back to the University of Washington, and I said, and they gave me the opportunity to say, well, you can meet with us and we'll tell you why you didn't get in. And so you know what they said was, I'm too young and I don't have the life experiences. So I was really offended by that. I'm like, well, I can't get any older. I'm 22. And at 22, you got a big ego also, you know. So but how can I get better life experiences with that? So. All right, so anyway, so I got in. I got in, I didn't get into the University of Washington. I ended up going to this school, which is not called this anymore, but Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in Kirksville, Missouri. So I went out there. This is a picture of one of the classes. They used to do an anatomy lab outside, apparently. So you see, yeah, I thought this was kind of interesting. So even back then, they were like joking around with the cadavers. <laughs> so holding them up and, and uh, anyway, uh, uh, now it's called A.T. Still University. A.T. Still is a founder of osteopathic medicine. So I went to Kirksville um, and I got my, my military or my medical education paid for by the military. Um, so they paid my full tuition, gave me a stipend. Uh, tuition at that time was about 30000 a year. Um, that was, I graduated in 99, so it would have been 95, I guess, 1995. So it's probably more expensive now. So. So the people that didn't have a scholarship, they would graduate and we'd all sit down with the financial officer at the end and you'd give you a paper that said how much debt you owed. You know, and I had a big fat zero on mine and then my buddy next to me had was like $120,000 debt that then he gets to pay off for the rest, you know, once he gets to be a doctor. Um, so just real quick about uh, what is osteopathic medicine. <laughs> I'm not really trying to plug it necessarily, but I thought I uh, should bring it up. This is, that's A.T. Still right there, this bearded guy right here. You know, look cool, this is the first class. So one thing you should notice about this class is, look at that, there, this young lady right here, this is actually a lady right here, it may not look like it, but. <laughs> right there, there's another one, I think that's one back there, but. So there's women in the class, right? So this is in 1870, I think, 1875, when the first class graduated, so that's a big deal having women that are graduating as physicians. So fairly progressive back in the day. But in the late 1800s, medicine was still trying to figure out which one was gonna win. Was it gonna be allopathic medicine, which is kind of common, what the MDs get to become, allopaths. Homeopathic medicine, that's Hahnemann, and there's a medical school, Hahnemann Medical School. Um, but, uh, but now it's an allopathic school, so and there's osteopathic. So the homeopaths believe that bad things are good for you in really small doses. So that's where you get the homeopathic medicines and treatments from, you know. So if you take some aspirin, if you're allergic to aspirin, if I give you a little bit of aspirin, maybe like, a, you know, and I dilute it way down and I slowly increase that over time, then you can tolerate aspirin. Or if you have allergies, I give you a little bit of pollen a little bit of that and then I dilute it out but I increase that, that concentration over time and then, uh, then you can tolerate and then you don't have your hay fever anymore or allergies, right, or, or bee allergy. So it kind of works, right? So in some cases, the homeopathic medicine can work. Allopaths, uh, or, uh, allopaths believe that, uh, that uh, ba basically their thought was that uh, to restore health, you needed to do something externally to the body to, to fix it, and so that's kind of, they're more focused on medicines and drugs, which work really well, and so that's why it's a much more popular way to go nowadays. But the osteopaths, basically, here's the tenet of the osteopaths, is the belief that um, the body can heal itself and has an amazing ability to do that, and so you should do whatever it takes to encourage the body to heal itself. So, um, uh, and so part of that has to do with this realignment. So let me give, give you an example. Let's say that there was a town that was starving. You know, let's say Stalingrad in World, World War II, right? It's starving and it's dying and you, you are, need to deliver supplies, food and aid to that town. Would you rather go over a road that was nice and smooth or would you rather drag your cart over one that's full of potholes? you know, and, and it's bumpy, right? You'd rather go over that nice, smooth one to make the town healthy. And so that's kind of this concept is, 
if you have an area that's sick in the body, for example, let's say you have uh, shoulder pain, then you have a lot of edema, you have problems with blood flow to the area. So if you can realign things to increase blood flow or such to the area, you can make the body will then heal itself. Or if you have pneumonia or that sort of stuff. So that was a tenet that AT still kind of believed in with that. And there was a guy named Dr. Palmer, I think he was in the first class of, of, of AT Stills class, he ended up branching off and just doing chiropractic medicine off of that. So for, if you're a DO, you get to learn how to do manipulation, you can do a little bit of chiropractic stuff. Um, but there's this belief that the body is one big system, and if you get it all in a line, then it all will be nice and healthy. And disease occurs when things are not quite in alignment or a trauma occurs or what have you. This is the nerve guy. So there you go. You're talking about labeling nerves. There you go. You're going to label the nerve guy. This is what Kirksville is famous for. Like they, some poor anatomy fellow like dissected out all the nerves of some guy. <laughs> or, or two anatomy uh, fellows did that. So anyway, you can go to the Kirksville and you can see that. <laughs> all right. So that's osteopathic medicine. But in reality, then from the osteopathic medicine, then I went off into, into the military, which is more of an allopathic program. And so even though I kind of had those tenets pounded into me, I ended up becoming more of an allopathic kind of thinker anyway with that. But osteopathic medicine also tends to produce more primary care type specialties. So anyway, so when you finish medical school, when you finish medical school, as you're starting to finish, then you got to pick on what resident, resident you want to go to, residency program. And so the very first fork in the road is do you want to do a surger, surgery or not surgery? And once you kind of latch on to one of those two, it makes the decision a little bit easier is say, hey, what am I interested in? Now it's hard to say, like, what are you really interested in if you've never done these things, right? Like a colorectal surgeon, like who wants to do that? Who wants to be <laughs> work on colons the rest of their life? But people do it all the time because they do, they, they do the surgery, they rotate through and they're like, hey, this is kind of cool. You know, I like taking out colon cancers and fixing anuses and things like that, I guess. And so, um, so those are some of the surgical specialties we have listed there. And then on the other side, the not surgery stuff, which is where I fall, um, is uh, primary care. And the OB-GYN kind of resides kind of a little bit on both because the gynecology is more, uh, is more of a surgical specialty. Um, but the, but OB in general, the OB kind of, kind of falls under primary care. So these are just some of the, and I'm sure that you all are familiar with some of these things. Um, and uh, here we go. So when you're thinking about what do I want to be, um, right now if you're, if you're pre-med, you're probably thinking that you know what you want to be. But then when you start to do other things, you may not. So I, like I said, I wanted to be a pilot. I ended up not being a pilot. Then I wanted to do neonatal intensive care because I wanted to be around really sick people and around kids uh, and be around a lot of drama. And uh, so I, I thought I wanted to do NICU care. And then when I rotated on pediatrics, I realized I couldn't stand working with kids' parents <laughs> <laughs> are very hard and grandmothers are really hard to deal with. And so, um, so I went away from that, but I still like the critical care realm, so that's why I decided to do internal medicine and then because that's a gateway into other types of subspecialties. So that's something you want to consider is, is uh, what are your skills and what are your values? If, you're, if you are very good at standing up and, 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 and uh, holding your bladder for six hours, then okay, then go to surgery. But if you're not, then maybe you shouldn't do surgery. Um, but what are your skills? Are you, well, if you're, you have very good manual dexterity. Uh, or not, you know, it's something that you have to be honest with yourself because I've seen in the GME programs in the military surgeons fifth, They're in their fifth year of training as a surgeon and they get kicked out because they can't do the skill They just cannot do it and some people can and some people can't like some people can play basketball and some people can't And it's just that's how it is. You just have to accept it. So yeah, you may want to be a surgeon, but you know, you, you just can't um, and it's better to know that up front instead of five years into a training program that you just wasted your life doing. And unfortunately with surgery, you don't really know can you or can you not do it until you do it. And so you may have to spend a year doing that and then realizing is this something I want to do or not. Uh, uh, we'll have to consider the lifestyle and so the, the, the days of working 80 hour weeks has kind of gone by the wayside. I think that the emphasis now is more on lifestyle for for this generation that's growing up 
and that's hard for the older, the older doctors to realize that people just aren't, would rather have their weekends off than make a lot of money. Would rather spend time with their family than make a lot of money, and, and it's really a disconnect that they just don't get, and so medicine is really starting to change now to focus more on lifestyle. But there are certain specialties where you have better lifestyle. Cardiology, not one of them. Uh, but uh, something like dermatology, well, that, that's pretty slick. Allergist, that's pretty good too, but uh, uh, that sort of stuff. So you have to consider the lifestyle, the work environment also. Um, do you like being around chaos and drama and people dying? You know, that's what I like to do, or <laughs> you, people just, some people don't like to do that. And so they, they'd rather be in a nice controlled environment and just see, you know, and see patients and, and be more cerebral to think about things. Um, you have to consider the pay. I know that that's not talked about a lot, but you're going into medicine because they, they make pretty decent money. And so you have to consider that, you know, if you're gonna spend seven years of your life after this, after undergrad, and you're gonna make 80,000 a year, um, is that something you really wanna do? You better really love your job, or would you rather spend seven years of your life and make 400,000 a year? Because that's the case, depending on what specialty you're in, you could make 80,000 or 400, doing the same amount of time of training. Uh, and so that's something to consider, uh, is that pay portion of that, and what are you willing you know, to, to cough up? So that's what I was mentioning earlier that's kind of nice about being a PA is you can zip through school and you can start making money a lot faster than what a doctor can, you know. And so that may be something that's, that's to be valued also. What is the future of the specialty? Uh, that's something that as you rotate through, you, that's something to ask the specialist is what's gonna, where, where do they see themselves, that specialty in 10 years? A lot of the specialties are changing. Internal medicine used to be a great specialty uh, to be in for clinic and uh, and such, but now they just be kind of became this uh, hospitalist, this workhorse that just kind of churns and burns patients all day long. Not very satisfying, where it used to be a very satisfying specialty. And then what's the future of medicine with the Affordable Care Act, with uh, change, drops in Medicare pay, that's a big deal, that uh, um, where is medicine going? Where, does it, where is the country taking medicine? Is it, the emphasis is gonna become more on preventative care, primary care, um, is going to become the emphasis, and so the model may change that the primary care specialties might start making the big bucks to encourage more people to do that, or the subspecialists like myself may actually be getting less pay than the primary care docs. So that's just something that, to think about and to pay attention to when you're considering what, what do you want to specialize in. <laughs> Excuse me. So you're going to have to interview again for these programs. So there, there's all that stuff again. Like I said, the one nice thing is extracurricular stuff is not really that much emphasized because now you want to have a resident that's not going to go and run marathons and go, you know, going to go compete doing some swim meet when they're supposed to be on call. You, don't want, you want somebody who's going to be focused now, which is kind of ironic because you didn't want that before. You want a well-rounded person, but now you don't. You want someone who's going to be there, they're going to, going to, learn, going to learn their skill. Uh, and again, are you teachable? And so now you've gone through medical school, so now you have a record of are you teachable or not? And that's what the letters of recommendation will say. Um, do you play well with others? So I find a lot that uh, at the fellow level that some people are not teachable, which means that they don't respond well to feedback. You know, it's always rough to hear, especially to hear negative things about yourself, especially when you get up to this level where you're a resident Everybody's been patting you on your back your whole life. You get good grades, and and uh, and everybody's saying, you know, you're doing a great job. And all of a sudden, that you know, you get to be a resident, and people are saying, you, you know, you don't know what you're doing. And you're like, what? Well, no one's told me that. I'm never, I don't know how to do this. I'm doing it bad. But uh, um, but that's you, you want to take that those that feedback in, and you want to you want to make yourself better for that. So how well are you at receiving that feedback? You know, so at the fellow level that I'm at now with the cardiology fellows, you know, there are 33, 34 year olds that I'm saying, you don't know how to do this. And they, sometimes I get very offended by that. Um, but they, uh, they all get better. <laughs> they have to. <laughs> uh, oh, there, there's the interview stuff again, just to kind of hammer that point. So I've spent a lot, too much time on that already. All right. So just a little bit more about myself. So from medical school in Missouri, then my first place I had to train at for internal medicine residency was uh, in Dayton, Ohio, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And this is a hospital that has no fellows. It just 
has an internal medicine residency program, so you get to do a lot of hands-on, a lot of hands-on work, um, which was great. And so being, a, being an intern, this is where I was an intern and where I was a resident at. Um, and so this is where the long hours kind of came in. So since this has occurred, so we didn't have any work hour limits. Now there are work hour limits. Um, so, so we cannot work residents and interns as hard as we used to, where I would literally be up for 36 hours straight trying to function, which is probably not very safe. And so now, um, now there are some very specific work hour rules um, that have to be, so internship is nowhere near as bad as it, as it used to be, which is kind of nice. Um, and there's pluses and minuses to that. I think I learned a lot, even if I was up 36 hours, but, uh, um, but anyway. So anyway, so, that, so I did that for three years. And then I applied for, um, oh, there we go, three years. Forgot about that. So I applied for a cardiology fellowship. And guess what happened? I didn't get in. Well, I didn't get in again. But <laughs> in the military system, it's a little bit different because it has to do with, uh, they give you this point system. And so they get more points if you, go out you know, and fight the war for a while, then they get rewarded by coming back and they can get into their training slot. So I didn't feel so bad about not getting in this time into the fellowship. But if you're going to a civilian program and you're applying for a civilian fellowship program, again, you gotta make sure your application looks good. You're doing all the research, getting your, you play well with others, and you did a little politicking. <clears throat> so I didn't get in, so I became a staff internist for one year, and that was a great opportunity um, there we go, to get deployed. So, got deployed. Um, this is actually bef uh, when, before Saddam invaded, invaded uh, uh, into Kuwait. Kuwait, right, before that occurred. Um, so it was pretty early on. So, um, this is a gunship, by the way, nice big gun right by my head. Um, so, and over there as a staff internist, all I did was work in the emergency room in our emergency department, and we didn't have any casualties or anything. We actually, in Oman, the planes would take, these gunships would take off, fly over into Iraq or into Afghanistan, and would just kind of kill some people, and then they'd come back in the, to our safe island. And so there wasn't really much going on for that. So, but it was a good experience. Makes you realize how the war machine works. So then I, I did get my fellowship because, like I said, it got deployed, and so then I was very competitive, uh, and I came down here to San Antonio. So I pretty much I've been in San Antonio since then. So it's been about 13 or 14 years that I've been in San Antonio. Uh, back when Wilfred Hall was a real hospital was when I did my cardiology fellowship. So again, the work hour rules didn't apply. Cardiology is another three-year program. So you do four years of med school, three years of internal medicine, three years of cardiology. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Plus your undergrad, fourteen years uh, to become a cardiologist. But the the great part is is that you're doing something that you want to do, and so it's very interesting. And so you're just compelled to to continue on, and you also get paid instead of paying somebody, you get paid. So that's nice. So it's just like a you know just like a job. Um, but if you were to break it down, and as a as an intern or resident, we did try to figure out like how much we got paid per hour. That we worked and it ended up being like three fifty an hour or something like that because <laughs> you work so many hours. But uh, so it, for fellowship training is similar to residency except you're much more specialized um, for that. And and I chose so I chose cardiology because I like like I said I like being around the drama and I like being around where people are coding uh, and for critical care is the cardi so if ever, if someone is coding. And everybody's around there doing compressions, and there's all these people around watching and gawking and things. And <laughs> when the cardiologist comes up, it's like the, you know, the, the C splits, and it's like walk in the cardiologist. And that's why I, I like that. <laughs> that. Walk in and like, okay, I got this under control. Because that feeds, that's like I said, that's my, part of my ego and feeds me, feeds my ego. And so uh, that's what I liked about cardiology and being able to take someone who's really sick. And, and bring them back, but you also, the other side of the coin is, are people that are really sick that then die. And so there's part of you that you have to be willing to deal with that part, uh, be willing to discuss with family members why somebody died, and it could be their 20-year-old son instead of a 90-year-old grandpa, right? So that's part of that you have to, when you're thinking about what specialty you would like to go into, 
um, have to be willing to deal with those things. <clears throat> so anyway, so that's uh, where I did cardiology at. And then I moved on to Boston. So, so one of the nice things I got to do was I got to specialize within cardiology. There's different subspecialties within cardiology. There's heart failure and transplant medicine. They have a critical care uh, specialty that just started up this year. Um, they have interventional cardiology, which would be putting stents in, putting valves in, and that sort of stuff. There's electrophysiology, which is the electrical system of the heart, putting in pacemakers, um, studying elect the, the current of electricity in the heart. And so these are all these different things you can specialize in. I didn't specialize in any of those. There's another one that's cardiac imaging, and that's what I did was cardiac imaging, which is not very dramatic of a, of a specialty, but I thought that it was interesting to do more non-invasive study of the heart. Cardiac imaging is kind of an up-and-coming specialty, and, and you get to use the latest technology to try to figure out the best ways to image the heart. So I had the opportunity to go to Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, which is attached to the Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital. They're kind of all in that, that area up in Boston um, to do that. And so this is kind of where it was my first exposure to academic medicine, the academic world. And so what I realized there is like these higher level institutions, um, Harvard Medical School, and I'd say, say the, the fellows and the residents that came through there, what they're, what they're creating are, are leaders of medicine, the policymakers of medicine, the ones that, you know, that uh, um, perform research. You know, the, the cardiology fellows would be very good at, you know, they might know vascular biology and the, how atherosclerosis works, uh, may be very good at that. So that, that's what's great about these large institutions, but the create, for them, they're not that good at creating clinical, clinical people. So it's nice to have a Harvard Medical School perhaps on your, on your uh, diploma that hangs on the wall, but how many of you know what medical school your doctors went to? Right? Did they go to Harvard or not? I know, I know there's a cardiologist I work with in San Antonio that uh, went to one of these top tier schools. Uh, he's making the same as the other person next door. So, it, so if you're gonna go and do clinical medicine, then, then, then what school you go to, you may wanna consider that a little bit heavier. If you really wanna go into academic medicine or into research, then these large powerful institutions are an amazing place to go. This is like the Hollywood of cardiology. You know, every, you, you just brush shoulders with all the greatest people and it, it was a great experience, but it, um, it was a good, good experience for me and exposure to bring back to the military so then I could do my own research there. So cardiac imaging, and this will give you some examples of what cardiac imaging looks like. So this is a nice CAT scan, right? So you don't really need to do anatomy like cadaver labs anymore. Some medical schools are actually moving away from cadavers. Uh, so get a nice vascular tree here. The heart's sitting behind the rib cage there, the sternum uh, on that one. So this is a, just another CAT scan, a cross section of a heart. This is not a normal heart um, here. Um, this is a, a, there's four chambers to our heart, right? I think humans have four chambers. So uh, you have an atria here. This is the left atrium. And so this would be the left ventricle. See, it's muscular, much more muscular. This is this little guy here is the right ventricle, which is kind of small um, for this patient. This is the right atrium here, which is just tremendously big. So it should be about the size of the left atrium. This is really big. This is a person who had tricuspid atresia, so their tricuspid valve really never developed. So they just had like a little pinhole. Um, to fill the right ventricle through the right atrium. So the right atrium became this dilated out to manage all that blood flow. <clears throat> so here's another heart. So that we can do CAT scans of the heart. We can look at coronary arteries. See, this, this is pretty slick. So this is kind of, Evan got a lot of exposure to this when he rotated with me. But uh, um, so the nice uh, coronary artery here. And so we can look for any blockages in the arteries. Um, so, that it's, so this is kind of what, what I got trained up in to do. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to show you that. I totally missed that too on there. There was an abnormality on this one. It's hard to see, I think maybe from the back, but there's a big tumor sitting right here. And so that's what I'm trying to show you. This is a tumor sitting right between the bifurcation of these two arteries. Right in the middle, there's this nice round tumor. This is a, this actually was a carcinoid tumor. Carcinoid tumor is a, is a type of tumor that secretes hormones. 
uh, specific types of hormones uh, to cause things like bronchospasm and diarrhea and things like that. So this lady shows up and she has wheezing all the time and she's like an adult, never had asthma. And she starts wheezing, starts having these hot flashes and, and, uh, and these spells and uh, you know, it took a while to find this thing, but that's where the tumor was sitting. And this little guy here was like leaching out uh, uh, badness. So I had to get cut out. I had to go to the surgeon and get that cut out. Um, all right, then I let's try to show you this MRI because I think this is what I like. Uh, I'll turn that down. Oh, there we go. All right. So, like I said, you don't really need to go to an anatomy lab anymore because I think MRIs and CTs do a great job of showing cardiac. Um, structure, function, you can measure physiology. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty amazing the images that you can get. There's a nice four-chambered heart there. See, the, this is the left atrium, left ventricle. These are pulmonary veins. You have four veins coming from the lungs that drain in. So you can see the blood draining in, gets thrown into the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle over here. So not quite as muscular. Um, there's a little mitral valve prolapse right there. <clears throat> on this person. So there's a two-chamber shot of the right ventricle. This is inferior vena cava that's coming up, filling into the right ventricle, and then there's this nice RV shot. I think there's a three-chamber shot here in a second that comes in. So this is amazing because this is all done with a big magnet and nothing else, I mean, and a fancy computer, but there's no contrast. There's, you don't need any IVs for this shot. You just throw them in the scanner and you can get these really nice pictures. There's a nice three-chamber shot. So aortic valve up there, opening and closing. There's the mitral valve of this person. There's a, a little bit of the right ventricle over there. Uh, you can also appreciate, I think, the relationship of the heart to the rest of the body as the heart beats. So this gets back to the osteopathic medicine. It's all one system, right? As this heart beats, it's pushing on the liver, it's pushing on the spleen. See that relationship? Like that happens every time your heart beats. That's going on in your gut. Right? It's massaging your gut, it's pushing that thing. So uh, in cardiology, there is an artificial heart now that's, that is called an um, uh, impella device. And it, it basically is a, a nice little co uh, circle that uh, you attach into the aorta. And then it has a little magnetic motor that spins this little impeller device. So basically, you just have continuous flow through the heart, there's no pulse anymore. There's no cystic or diastole, it's just one pulse. And that was a big concern was what's gonna to happen to the body if they don't have this pulsation going on, you know, over time, is, is there something, some issue with that? You know, um, so, uh, and some patients don't like that, so they'll show up in the emergency room with something and you try to feel their pulse and there's no pulse, but they're, they're alive. <laughs> All right. So after Boston, so I did one year in Boston, back to San Antonio uh, to become a staff cardiologist. And uh, oh, I got deployed a couple more times, forgot about that, <laughs> to try to wrap things up. This was in Balad, Iraq, so now in the heat of the Iraq war, I had the pleasure of working in a surgical intensive care unit. Um, and uh, did a lot of, not, didn't see a lot of Americans that came through when I was there. We did a lot of, uh, saw a lot of Iraqis that were blown up by suicide bombers. Uh, and or you know the Al Qaeda didn't like you for some reason, then they'd blow you up, and then we would take care of them. So this was a person who had a actually had a uh, uh, what we call a cardiac contusion. So he was around a, a bomb that blew up, and the force, the sound waves of that, um, pushed on his sternum enough that uh, and, and vibrated his heart enough that he then got was bleeding around his heart, the sac, the pericardial space around his heart. So this was us putting in, uh, put in a nice little drain around the heart and then we did it pull out all this blood that was sitting on the outside of his heart, but it was preventing his heart from functioning properly. So that's me looking happy, satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, another time, a few years later, I went to Bagram, Afghanistan. And, and as you know, we're still in Afghanistan and it sounds like we're gonna be there for a while longer. And, and over here, I got a then function as a cardiologist and taking care of active duty troops or any heart attacks that came in. And uh, Afghanistan, what's nice about Bagram is you're surrounded by these nice mountains. You're about, it's like 5,500 feet is the elevation. <laughs> so this was a, a fun deployment also. And the jets would take off and they'd have to, or they'd come back, they'd have to go over these hills and then straight down into the land or these big planes did that. They'd go over, and unfortunately, when I was there, there was one plane that didn't go over, and it just went right into the, 
hill on the way back. But, uh, but uh, those are good experiences. Like I said, you get to learn where, where medicine falls into the big war machine of things and what's our primary job out there and why, why we're in the military and why we do what we do. Do a lot of humanitarian work. Here I got to work at a Korean hospital that took care of local Afghan population. Uh, so you saw a lot of uh, third world types of diseases. And, uh, and you, what you realize is that uh, um, in both of these countries, you know, the majority of people just want to raise their family, have kids, and, and be left alone, just like we do. And, and that's, that's how majority of, but there's these other bad people that want to disrupt that sort of thing. And that's what it really, what I realized out there is that, you know, that was everybody, everybody <laughs> in, in, on, on this earth is pretty much the same. That's all what we all want to do is raise our family and be safe. You know, and uh, it doesn't mean you have to have a job, but as long as you raise a healthy family. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, that that's not always the case that that happens. Other things get in the way. <laughs> so that was a good learning experience. So this is kind of where I sit now. I'm a staff cardiologist, uh, and I've been at, back in San Antonio for about five or six years or so. And I run the cardiac imaging program. So just to give myself a pat on the back, um, uh, before I, before I, uh, I went to Boston, we were doing about five cardiac MRIs a year. And now that I'm back, we're doing like 600 a year. So we've really been able to grow our MRI program a lot. And so um, that's, a nice, that's a nice skill. I'm the only one in the Air Force that, can, that does that. And the only one in San Antonio that uh, does cardiac MRI for a, a town that's over a million people in that town. Um, so, so it's kind of a nice little niche, and that's what keeps me in San Antonio and keeps me in the military, is so I can keep doing that. Uh, the, I'm the program director for the Cardiology Fellowship, the only fellowship program in the Air Force, and one of two programs of the Army that I, I run. Uh, and then I'm also flight, the flight commander. I got to do my military duties, so I oversee all the uh, internal medicine doctors and all the technicians and all for all the subspecialties within internal medicine, keep them in line as well and then in a few years I put down here retirement <clears throat> so a little plug for the military here so in about three years this is what, well, this is what I'm going to do <laughs> and then I'll make money right so that's what's nice you know I'm, I'll be 46 years old and I'll be retired from the military and then every day I wake up I make you know I, I make I make money I make more than what a what a school teacher does um, in my retirement so so that's, that's pretty nice, and, and that makes me feel better when, I, when my friends who went to medical school didn't go through the military, they're making a lot of money now, and, and they make me jealous every day. Uh, but they don't have all those experiences, you know, that, you know they're, they're not going to go to a third world country probably until maybe they're retired. Um, they're not going to see, you know, uh, what, what a war can do to people. They're not going to work with, you know, pilots and bombers and, and learn all this stuff. So I think it's been a, a great experience. So, um, so the take home points after all of that um, is to plan ahead. And one thing I learned is let people know your plans. Don't assume that people know what you want to do. Uh, and this works, for, I think, for any career you're in. I'm doing that right now in my job, too, is, is uh, you need to let people that are, that are in those positions of power know what you want to do uh, so they can help guide you there. And, and don't be humble and, and stay back and don't say anything. If you want to go to medical school, or if you want to go to grad school, or you want to do these things, you got to let somebody know because no one's going to know unless you unless you talk to your, you know, someone about that. Find a mentor to glom onto that you get along with, and prepare and take control of your career because no one else is going to be interested in you. And once you graduate, you know, probably probably not not a lot of people here are going to really care what you go on to do because they're going to be too busy trying to do their own thing. So you have to take control of that and speak up and, and uh, let people know your plans. Play well with others, that's kind of the big underlying thing. And then diversify, so make sure that you're doing a lot of different things to uh, buff up your portfolio. You know, if it's volunteering or if it's research or writing or, like I said, art and music and those sort of things, you want to throw some of that into your life so you're just not really good at Call of Duty, plus you have good grades. <laughs> so. Anyway, I think that uh, oh, that's all I have. So thanks for your attention.
you guys have any questions or anything, then feel free to ask. No, they're all convinced. Oh, yes, ma'am. Said about what? What's my lifestyle for for cardiology? Um, it's uh, uh, it, so it, it's I'd say it's fairly busy if I compared cardiology to other types of specialties. So that during the daytime, your normal, uh, let's say, if you start the day at eight o'clock, and usually most days you're you're done by five o'clock. And then you go home, but then you're but then you have to be on call periodically, depending on how many people are in your practice. You might be on call one week out of every four weeks, or one week out of every six weeks. So when you're on call as a cardiologist, more than likely you're going to be called multiple times throughout the night, and be and might have to go in to see patients uh, um, from that standpoint. And then periodically you'll have weekends you have to go in on too. So, um, so that's kind of like the, I think the general cardiology lifestyle is not quite a nine to five job that you're always kind of on um, for that. And, and uh, um, it's not as intense as when you're a fellow, then you, it's much more intense uh, then. So yeah, so my, my lifestyle now, because I'm in the military, things are a little bit different and I'm in a training program. So we start, our fellows show up at 7 a.m. to start learning about EKGs. And so the, the duty day for them ends at about 4.30. And so we're usually a 7 to 4.30 uh, type, of, type of operation. But, uh, but for cardiologists, it, you can make it as busy as you want. And that's the great thing about medicine is it, if you want to make a lot of money, you can work 80 hours a week if you want. You know, then I know a lot of people, especially a lot of moms, that do part-time. You know, part-time for cardiology is more like 40 hours. But, uh, but you know, so they're, they're, they're very satisfied making half of what they would make that, that their partners are making. But then they have their lifestyle. They can, they can watch their kids go to school. They can be home when their kids come home, take time off when their kids are sick. And so that's, that's what's really nice. Like I said, the practice of medicine is changing more for lifestyle. So there's a lot of this hybrid type of scheduling that's going on now um, that really helps with that lifestyle, you know, since money is not the not really the driving factor like it used to be back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Yes, sir. Real quick, uh, we see, uh, we had a, a talk on concussions uh, with Dr. Cantu, but one of the other big issues and several kids were writing in my physiology class on sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Uh, would you uh, comment briefly on what one can do Right. Well, there, there's a few causes for sudden death in the young and, and in the athletes. Uh, and so one of them when it comes with a concussion is called commotio cordis. And commotio cordis is, a, um, well, actually on this EKG thing, there's a certain time period uh, which tends to occur um, usually around this T wave or a little bit afterwards when the heart's resetting itself for the next electrical system, electrical beat to occur. So it's electrically trying to reset itself. Well, it turns out in this time period, it's very vulnerable to abnormal heart rhythms. If something, if you were to deliver a, a certain amount of electricity to that spot, you can you can cause a heart to fibrillate. And so, uh, um, so with commotio cordis, if you happen to strike somebody hard enough in the chest, you're going to deliver an electrical current will occur, or it's trauma, but but the heart views that as a stimulate some sort of stimuli. And if you happen to hit exactly on that spot, which is about a 10 millisecond window, you can fibrillate somebody. And uh, there's some really nice case reports you can look up if you Google it. There's a picture of like in this uh, karate match, and you see these two kids standing there, you know, doing karate, and then the next picture, he's like on the ground dead. You know, just like gets kicked in the chest and he's gone. And so that's one cause, that's very uncommon, commotio cordis. Uh, more, more commonly, you'd see it's someone like what has a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so where the heart enlarges, the septum enlarges, and, and uh, they're at a high risk for arrhythmias also. Right ventricular dysplasia is a genetic cause. And then you get kids that are hyped up on all sorts of stimulants uh, from working out, right? So all those pre-workout drinks, 
that you guys get at GNC. Um, and then you take it on top of that, you're like, oh, I'm gonna hit a couple monsters, then I'm gonna go work out, you know, and then that puts you at a higher risk for arrhythmias uh, also. And so um, there, there are uh, some methods of screening for those things. So the Italians decide they're gonna do EKGs on everybody because they, have a high, they actually have a higher incidence of right ventricular dysplasia there. And so that's what kind of what they do. We haven't really incorporated that uh, screening ECGs for everybody, and so we just do a physical exam. There is a cardiologist, um, I can't think of his name right now, over at Texas Heart Institute that wants to do MRIs on high school students. And so a real quick 10 minute scan, you can rule out right ventricular dysplasia, you can rule out hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, bicuspid aortic valve, aortic uh, dilation, you know, boom, you ruled it out, and then, um, so they should be fairly good to go. So he's in a big research uh, trial right now looking at that. Oh, anomalous coronary, sorry, I forgot that one add to the list. So there's a little a handful of things that can kill some, uh, somebody when they're young, and it's, it's always very tragic when that happens. So the actual incidence is extremely rare, but when it does happen, it's all over the news, right? It's all over the news. And in the military, we see, we have thousands of people that go through our system that get trained over at Lackland. And so usually once a year, somebody has sudden death for some reason uh, over there. And statistically, that's what should happen. About one per year going through there should have sudden death. And so it's trying to find that person before it happens. That's the hard part. Um, especially nowadays, you have a lot of kids that, uh, no offense to you guys, but, uh, <laughs> that they spend their, their, their pre-college days not being very active, pre-18, so from age whatever, five to 18. They do a lot, a lot of video games or aren't participating in sports, and so their first exposure to actually running might be basic training. And so they could have had a congenital heart disease that never reared its head because they never pushed themselves. And then they go into basic training, and it's like, hey, go run two miles, and, and then, then they collapse, so some, that's why we tend to pick them up in the military. Okay, well thank you very much for your attention. Students at TLU engage in high impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.